Greetings, everybody. This is uh, Philip Shields. What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So said Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare may think so, that a name isn't all that important, but God puts a lot of stock in what he names things. Names have a lot of meaning to God, and having a name is very important to God. Your name becomes your trademark. Who you are defines you. It's what people think of when they think of you. <clears throat> when they think of your name, images come to mind. Describe what he sees in you and what you really are. God has many names. That's, worth of a, that's worthy of a whole topic all by itself. Today what I want to talk about is about the new names that God says you're going to have and I'm going to have in the kingdom, in his kingdom. I want to talk about those new names and what they possibly could be, why you're going to be given new names and more than one name from God. We'll study some of the other matters that concern, uh, concern names and what happens to you because of your name and how God's going to be able to use you better and more for his will and purposes in the future. When God uses the word name, he's also referring to your reputation, not just what you're called. When God speaks of having a good reputation, though, I think he's really referring to what you really are, not just what people think you are. You see, character is what you really are, Reputation is what people think you are. So when God says your name, he's talking about what you and I really are. Not what we were. That's different. What we are today. God looks about uh, on a man the way he ends up, not the way he was five years ago, five minutes ago, or five, 50 years ago. And now reputation may last a lifetime, but thank be to God, he looks at the way a person ends up. And so that's why I want to give this, uh, this topic, because I know a lot of you hearing this are less than perfect. Did I say a lot, or do I mean all of us hearing this are less than perfect? I certainly need a new name, and you need a new name if you were humble enough to understand it. I think most of you are probably going to understand it as we go through the topic here. Proverbs 22, verse 1 says, A good name or reputation is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor, being held in high esteem, is better than silver or gold. And the one we want to really be held in high esteem for is God Almighty himself. Now, reputation is what people think of you. And, of course, reputations and names can be ruined in just an instant by even just one act of folly or sin. We've all done things like that. It's just that some haven't had all their follies exposed. And so they go around talking about other people's follies and sins. Now, for example, uh, there were many adulterers in the nation of Israel in David's day, many murderers. But we read of David's adultery. We read of David's murder. And that does tarnish David's reputation horribly. We still read of it. And David paid and paid and paid for what he did with Uriah and with Bathsheba. And God is able to help us, though, upon repentance, as he did David, to start over and rebuild the name. And he goes on even further, as we shall see. So be turning to Revelation 3, and I'm hoping that many of you will find inspiration from this. Encouragement, that's always my goal, is to have us look forward to the kingdom of God, look forward to meeting our Savior and our Redeemer, and to be kind to one another, because we're all in the same boat as sinners. There's some who don't seem to know that, and want to spend their time tarnishing and ruining names even further than they already have been. God be merciful to people like that, because we're here to try to give each other and believe the best in each other. Love hopes for all things. Love believes all things. Some people don't have a lot of love, and want to tarnish people's names. And it's time that you and I realize that we're here to build names and give good names and we're here to build the name that God gives us and to uh, be walk worthy of the names God gives us and if you have tarnished your name you can get back in the in the fight you can have a redeemer you can have a new name and I hope you find that encouraging and inspiring in spite of anything that's happened in your past in spite of anything anybody calls you and so we have to, though, live up to and, and live with some of the consequences that might result from some things we've, we've done. And we might have to live with the consequence of people discarding us, friends leaving us, opportunities vanishing if we've really done something stupid. I know. I've been there. But those are consequences we caused ourselves. But thank be to God we have a Redeemer who is going to let us have a new name. I'm so excited about it. Because someday I'm going to be able to look people in the eye who think that I've absolutely r ruined everything because they know of a sin or two that I've had in my life, or three or four, or ten or whatever, and as if they don't have any. 
Well, the one who's forgiven much also loves much. I love my God, I love my Savior, and I love my Redeemer with all my heart, because I know what he's done for me. And I want him to help me share that knowledge and that awareness of what he's done and is doing for you as well. Now, if we've spoiled a reputation, God can, and God will, and God does redeem us. And he does give us a new name. Even if you think your name and reputation are secure right now, it's still going to have to be changed. So don't sit so high on your high horse because all of us have sinned and we all have sullied our names and God says we all need a new one. Why would God give you a new name if he, if, uh, he felt yours was good enough? Okay, We all, all need a new name. When you understand this topic, you're going to want a new name. Turn to Revelation 3 and verse 12. This is speaking to the uh, uh, Philadelphian congregation or group of the Church of God. This was a church that was meeting on what is now Western Turkey. And it was on a mail route. And Revelation 3 verse 12, Jesus speaking to that particular congregation, says, Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. He's going to be one of the leading people in the temple, which is the church, which is uh, the headquarters of the kingdom, so to speak. And he's going to be a leading person there, a pillar, just like Peter, James, and John were. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. That's the first name we're going to be given. The name of the city of my God, the second one there, which is the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven from God. And I will write upon him my new name. So three names are mentioned here. Now, God who called you and called me will not easily discard us, and God wants to redeem us and give us a new name. He is called our Redeemer. Brethren, you don't buy something back. You don't redeem something that has no value in your eyes. God is going to redeem us. God is redeeming us. God has redeemed us. And if God is willing to buy me and redeem me, he must see something in me he wants to redeem. And if God is going to redeem you and buy you and, and, uh, and, and buy you back and save you, he must think you're worthy of salvation. He must think that, you, you, that he wants to save you. Let's put it that way. You don't redeem a bunch of worthless dirt. For example, if you redeem something from a pawn shop, it's because you see value in the item. So God redeems us, but he does something even better than that, uh, better than redeeming our names. He gives us a new one. Now, today I want to share this topic about our new names, so let's get into it. Revelation 3.12 will be sort of the text for the day, and the three names that are mentioned here. I hope you find it inspiring. Number one, the name of my God. I will write upon him the name of my God, Revelation 3.12. What is God's name, the name of my God? Well, that could be a whole Bible study by itself, brethren. Maybe I'll have one on just the names of God. But be turning to Ephesians 3 for now. And remember that when it says the name of my God, I don't think it's primarily referring to Jesus Christ here. Jesus is the one talking and so to the uh, Philadelphian church. And so when he says the name of my God, then uh, Jesus himself called God the Father in John 20 his God. And Jesus himself said that. He said after he was resurrected, I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now what is God's name? And why is that important in this topic? So the name of my God must refer to the Father, God the Father himself. God's church, remember, is called the Church of God because it's his assembly. It's his people. It's his group. It's his house. In Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15, Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Okay, I bow my knees to the Father of Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. From whom? So what family is he talking about? It has to be the family of God. Some Bible translations even say from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, instead of just saying like King James and New King James, the whole family. But God is not the Father of the people of the world yet. Not yet. When he saves them, when he calls them, saves them, redeems them, he will be their father. But right now, God is not the father of the unsaved. Not until they disown their present father and receive the seed of God, his Holy Spirit, are they brought into God's family. I'm not saying anything bad about them. I'm just saying their time has not yet come. 
Jesus said so to the people of his time on earth who were baiting him. If you turn with me to John John 8, John 8, verses 41 to 44. John 8, verses 41 to 44. John 8, 41. He says to them, You do the deeds of your father. You do, you do the deeds of your father. Now Jesus gives them some bait in return and they snatch it. So they quickly come back and said, hey, we're not born of fornication, hinting that Jesus was born of fornication, that he was illegitimate. He says, we have one father, and that's God. But Jesus quickly puts that notion to rest. Jesus was not afraid of confrontation, sometimes a, almost an in-your-face approach, which he certainly shows here. He's certainly very direct. He was not being diplomatic at all in this particular instance. So in John 8:42, he said things as they were. He called the spade a spade. He called the shots exactly what, they, what he saw as he saw them. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, John 8:42, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Now listen, now listen carefully to John 8:44. You are of your father, the devil. Now he wasn't saying it just to the Jews of his day. This is said to everybody who is not yet born of God or saved or, or being called of God or part of God's church. People who don't have yet God's spirit. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Now, God's going to redeem these people eventually, and he, he has done that beginning with us, and God is going to bring us into his family. And so, and then he adopts us and begets us into his family, and so he becomes our father. Someone can't be your father unless he's given you his seed, which is the Holy Spirit, or unless he adopts you. And therefore, we're of the same stock, the same DNA, if you will. And that's what it says in 1 Peter 1.23 where it says that we're not being born again or begotten again, not of corruptible seed this time. He says we're, we're not being um, begotten of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. And that's why it says in Romans 8 that those who have God's Spirit, around verse 12, I didn't write the verse down, but those who have God's Spirit and are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. It might be 12 or 13, 14, somewhere in there. Romans 8, you can't be led by something you don't have, something you can't see. You, I mean, uh, something you don't have available to you. Well, we can't see the Spirit, but, I mean, we can certainly feel its presence. We certainly can live with it within us. You can't have the Spirit unless you're called by God. Come to Jesus Christ. Go through Jesus' open door and accept him as your Savior and King, God, and Master. And I pray all of you who will ever hear this message, if you've never done that, that you will do so. Or if you have done that and have begun to walk away from him, that you'll get back to the straight and narrow, that you'll get back to the walking with God and obeying him and keeping his commandments and seeking him and seeking his face with all your being, with all your might. Now please be turning with me to John 20. I, I referred to this briefly earlier, John 20. Uh, remember what Jesus himself said when he was resurrected. Okay, by now he's resurrected. The garden tomb is empty. Uh, he meets Mary Magdalene at the garden tomb, and notice what he says to her after she recognizes him. And uh, remember, the Father calls us, and as we shall, uh, as we shall be, the very bride of Christ. The uh, the bride of Christ was selected by the Father, but then Jesus is the one who meets us and takes us to the Father, and introduces us to Father. Remember, it says in Acts that we can be saved by no other name than the name of Jesus Christ. But Jesus' goal is to introduce us to the Father as well as to himself, since Jesus will be the husband, but we are but we are being granted the family name and being brought into the family of God the Father. And, and, and remember this, that as we emphasize Jesus Christ, we must also emphasize his Father. The whole point of Jesus Christ was to bring us to his Father and introduce us to God Almighty. And that we become part of his church, part of his household, part of his temple. And he indwells us by the Holy Spirit. Now in John 20, verse 17, Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, who's coming up to give him a hug, Don't cling to me, Mary, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. He was the first fruit. 
Uh, he was the wave sheaf offering that had to be lifted up and waved to God the Father in heaven and accepted. And that's a different topic, too. If you don't know what I mean, we'll get into that some other time. But go to my brothers, my brethren, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father. Now we know who that is. That's God. I'm going up to God, he says, and your Father. So he makes it very clear that when he says, my Father, that he wants them to understand that same Father is their Father now as well. He says, to my God. So God the Father, Jesus actually calls my God. I'm going to my God and your God. So when we go back to Revelation 3.12, in that first passage we looked at, when, when talking about the names of God, where it says, I will write upon him the name of my God. Father in heaven is considered Jesus' God. That's what it says in Revelation 3.12. I'll write upon him the name of my God. And that's what it says here in John 20.17 that I'm going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, Jesus is also God, but there's God the Highest, which is God Almighty, God the Father, and then there's Jesus Christ the Son. He is not God the Highest. God the Highest is God the Father. We can't be Jesus' brother. We can't be Jesus' sister. It says, go to my brethren, here in John 20, 17, unless we're sons and daughters of the same father that he is of, folks. Unless we're sons and daughters of the same father that he is of. Isn't that exciting? Now, what Jesus said to Mary Magdalene was a thunderbolt of new thought back then. God, as they knew God until Jesus came, was the awesome, terrible, fearful God that Daniel spoke of as the unapproachable God in his, all his holiness, that awesome and terrible God. Terrible in the sense of fearsome to be in front of. But here Jesus say, is saying that God is your pater, your father. The Greek word here is, uh, is pater, um, uh, P-A-T-E-R, which simply means father or parent. Now, some of you hearing this have never had a loving father, a dear father, a good father. You all have fathers or you wouldn't be here. But perhaps your own physical dad was distant. Maybe he was unloving. Maybe he was too busy. Well, i got to watch that. Perhaps worse, maybe he abandoned you. Maybe he was a criminal, a jailbird, a drug addict, an abusive drunkard. Or maybe he had those problems and faults and still was a good daddy loving to you in spite of his weaknesses whatever forgive him folks and listen to the study I have on forgiving as God forgives might as well build as close as strong as respectful as loving a relationship with your human father as well as much as you can the fifth commandment honor your father and mother doesn't say honor them only if they are worthy of honor does it it says honor them because he's your dad Honor your mother because she's your mom. Period. Doesn't matter if she's a drug addict or a whore. Or a drunkard. Or a good mom. Honor her. And honor your father. Now, perhaps on the other hand, God may have blessed you with an incredible human father. And if so, value what that does for you too. I had a pretty nice dad. Except I didn't see him much after age 12 when he and my mother divorced. He was in the Philippines, and I was in Los Angeles. I didn't see him much before 12. And except for one long trip of three weeks, I could count on my hand the number of hours I spent with him after that, age 12 to 20. But one thing I now know, you now have, and I now have, the Father to top all fathers. You have come into the family of the highest. And it didn't just happen. He picked you. And that's what Jesus told his disciples in John 15:16. John 15:16. Hey, remember you can uh, print a transcript of these notes if you want to. You can pause the message and print the transcript off so you can follow up, follow along, uh, virtually word for word. Uh, from I, I, I listen to these afterwards and try to get as close to word for word as I can. I, it's not always perfectly because that would take just so long. I'm just a one-man shop here. And I'm trying to uh, still earn a living for my family as well. But in John 15:16, you did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you. 
And he decided to bring you into this elite group, this incredible collection of people who, who come from all walks of life. And no one's great, or very, very few are great, mighty, and noble. Not many mighty, not many wise men are called, says in 1 Corinthians 1. But this incredible collection of people who will work together in loving harmony, though we're far from perfectly doing that right now, God wants us to change that, wants us to start to forgive and come together and work together if we're really his children so the world can know that we're his children by the way we're one together and love one another, forgiving one another, accepting one another. And those who won't do that won't be in the kingdom, brethren. They won't be part of that family. The highest, the creator God, the eternal himself, is one you can always approach and one who will never, ever, no, never, ever, leave you or forsake you. I want you to really understand that. Now you have your father, don't forget him. You have your father in heaven. Don't ignore him. Do come to him and live and breathe and move in him. I'll just cite a few verses. You know I'm pretty sure. You can write the passages down instead of turning to them all for time's sake. In Matthew 12 verse 50, Matthew 12 verse 50, Jesus said, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now let's reread Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. This time I'm going to use the NIV, the, uh, the New International Version. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. Here it says, his whole family. God the Father is not just the Father of Jesus. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, which we just read, says he's as much a father of all of those. Jesus and he are, and God the Father are calling into a relationship with him. As, he, as much as he's a father for Jesus. Also in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, it says, I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters. So ladies, don't feel left out. 2 Corinthians 6.18 And you shall be my sons and daughters. Isn't that awesome? Says the Lord God Almighty. The chance to be the son of God. There are times that we, you might have been tempted to wonder what it, what it would have been like to be the son of royalty or the daughter of royalty. Well, you are, brethren. Open your eyes and accept it. Now turn with me to John 1 and verse 10. John 1 and verse 10. John 1 and verse 10. He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, John 1 verse 11 now, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. John 1 verse 10. Who were born or begotten, is the same Greek word there, not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. Children of God, belonging to, means his children, his kids. Now please be turning to 2 Samuel 12. Now as children of God, as you turn to 2 Samuel 12, we carry that family name everywhere we go, with every word we utter, every act we do, every look and every movement we make. Everything we do reflects on our family and on our family name. We are of the family of God and hold that name either in reverence, which we must do, or disrespect. We keep it holy, which we must do. And if you have failed in that, as I have in the past, I am trying my best with God's help and God's spirit to keep God's name holy, to walk a holy life today, to make a difference today, to grow and overcome today. We must, brethren, end up correctly. It doesn't matter what you did in the past. What matters is how you end up. 
or we can make God's name holy, or we can profane it and make it unholy, or make it treat it as an unholy thing. We can't make it unholy. God's name is holy, but but we can treat it as unholy. We bring God either honor and glory as lights of the king's way, or we bring it dishonor. And I've done plenty of both, but I have repented of the dishonor that I've sometimes brought my father and his family when I've failed. You've done that too, though yours may not be, in your mind at least, as serious as mine, or as open. Uh, as mine. I just keep talking about mine because I know mine. I don't know yours. But I'm trying to be open to you so you understand that if you feel bad about your past, you can too have a new start. You can too start with God afresh. And we all must. And if we've repented, there may still be consequences, but at least God forgives even some people who want to act like Satan and be the accuser of the brethren and go on destroying your name or whatever else might be left of your reputation, as if they'd never sinned themselves. They forget the admonition that let he who is without sin cast the first stone. So if you know of someone's sins, especially if their present life reflects a new life in Christ, you become the more guilty one if you dig up someone's past and go spreading around all that dung to everyone you can. I'm a little annoyed because I, I keep hearing people who are doing that. You can't go flinging dung without getting a lot of crap on yourself. I don't apologize for the language. That's exactly what you're going to get on your hands if you go flinging it at someone else. But God be merciful to you if you, don't, if, if you do do that. Don't do it. For if we are so unforgiving and so mean to others to gossip about their past, what comes around goes around, and God may have some unforgiving, may not be so forgiving of you, may not be uh, so willing to, he says he won't be forgiving of you if you're unforgiving. That's a very serious thing. So having said that, when we don't hold God's name, which he gives us to carry, when we don't hold it in the highest esteem we can, God gets really upset because we, in a sense, hold his name in our conduct. David sins with Uriah, Bathsheba, and the resultant death of dozens of people. Not just Uriah. It's a case in point. When, when he had Uriah, the, the husband of Bathsheba, killed, the story is in Second Samuel uh, chapter 12, and uh, prior to that is what, what he did. And if you don't know the story, go back and read it. But when he had Uriah killed so he could have Uriah's wife, it wasn't just Uriah that was killed. There were many, many other soldiers that were killed in that ambush or in that uh, trick that they did. Now in Second Samuel 12, verses 7 to 15, uh, Nathan finally comes and confronts David about his sin and the consequences that David's going to have now as a result, including constant sword, uh, the sword, he said, and warfare and uh, that he's going to have to face. And he's going to have uh, his own wife taken away from him. Uh, he's going to have some horrible things going on. You can read that in Second Samuel 12, verses 7 to 12. Now, let's pick up, though, and for time's sake, in verse 13. So David said to Nathan, after all of this, when Nathan said, David, you've done some horrible things, and what you did secretly, God's going to uh, do all his punishments before that he's announced to you just now before the sun, out in the open. So David said to Nathan, he didn't, he didn't deny any of it, and he didn't justify himself about any of it. He said, I've sinned against the Eternal, against the Lord. Nathan said to David, the Lord, or the Eternal, where you have the L-O-R-D all in caps, that's Yahweh. The Eternal, that's the, uh, the Hebrew there, also has put away your sin. See, here he had sinned, and the Eternal put, it, put away your sin. You shall not die. But notice verse 14. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Eternal to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. And then Nathan departed to his office, but the, I mean to his house. But, but I wanted to emphasize verse 14, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. Yeah, look at that David over there. He calls himself the king of Israel. And he tries to get people to go to that temple. And you know you know what I've heard about him? I heard that baby he has isn't really his baby. And, you know, it's kind of strange the way Uriah died. And all the gossip that was going around, and they started to mock David, who was God's prophet on earth. And it brought shame not only to David, but it brought shame and blaspheme to God himself. And God took that very, very personally. And so when I misconduct myself, or when you do, and we're in doing things we shouldn't be doing, or saying things we shouldn't be saying, or acting in ways that don't bring honor to God, God takes that pretty hard. 
because we're carrying his family name, Christian. We're, car we're, we're carrying the house of God, the church of God, his family name with us wherever we go. And people will think about God whatever they think of you because that's how they're supposed to see God, I guess. And that's how they learn about God is through our conduct. David repented. God will let him be king over Israel in the resurrection. David is remembered for many, many wonderful things. And in time, surely he can, we can purge this sin from our memory too. There are people today who, have, who would have no fellowship with someone like a David, someone who's an adulterer, let alone a murderer. How about David? Would you, would you fellowship with someone like that? Would you let him be part of your church? There are some ministers and some groups who are more righteous than God. God took a split second to say to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, and you shall not die. David deserved to be stoned to death, both for murder and also for adultery. So did Bathsheba. Neither one was. So keep that in mind. Would you fellowship with David if he were in your church, in your neighborhood, in your congregation? Would your church allow him to be there? God allowed him to write many, many of the Psalms. Now what people think of you and me will be what they may think of God's people and God himself, since we claim to be God's people. It's an awesome responsibility, though we often fail. Every time I'm, I'm unkind or every time I fall short, every time I do something stupid and sinful, and it's more than I want, I think of that verse uh, of David and we have to repent. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the seed of God. And as we grow, we're supposed to look like our Father more and more. It says that in 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. I'd like you to hear the uh, message I have on being a new creation in Christ. It goes into far more of this than I have time to in this message here. That uh, we're now to walk as he walks. 1 uh, John 2, verses 3 to 6. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he who says, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. And he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. I'm going to do another message eventually on, on what it means to be in God, in Christ, in him. And uh, because uh, that is a very, very interesting topic. Now, we are supposed to walk just like God and be looking more and more like him as we get older and older in our spiritual walk, as we mature spiritually is what I'm trying to say. We should be walking like God. Over time, we start to even look like God. So people ideally could say to you someday, everything I've ever learned about God, I've learned by watching you. Isn't that what Jesus was saying when he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Should it be any less for you and me eventually, if not right now, that we would be able to someday say, if you want to know what Father's like, watch his people. I don't know if I'm ready to say watch me. I think I am changing and growing. But uh, I might point him to other people because I surely don't deserve to have people watch me to learn about God. Not yet. Paul said, follow me as I follow God. So he said, you know, don't follow me all the way because he said also in Romans 7 that I still do the things which I hate. So we've all been led by God's Spirit. We all have to be led by God's Spirit and learn what it means to be children of God. And we're to take the Father's name so God the Father fully becomes our own real dear Abba Father. In the New Testament, word, uh, New Testament I think it's Aramaic, the word used for Father when referring to God is Abba, more like our Daddy, Abba. In Romans 8, verses 14 to 17, beautiful passage there. In Romans 8, 14 to 17, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. You can have God's Spirit and not follow it. And you won't have it for long if you, do, if you don't follow it. So when we have God's Spirit, we have to let God lead us, walk in front of us, and let us walk with Him. And walk, walk with Him. These are the sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Abba, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. As much as Jesus Christ is an heir of God, we are joint heirs with him, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, what does Abba mean? 
According to Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, it says here that slaves were forbidden uh, to address the head of the father of the family by this title. Abba is the word framed by the lips of infants and betokens unreasoning trust. Father, however, expresses an intelligent apprehension of the relationship. The two together express the love and intelligent confidence of a child. That's what it says here about this passage in Romans 8.15. That when you have Abba, it's what an infant would say, Abba, like we say Dada or Mama. Here it's Abba. Abba could well have been the first intelligible word a Hebrew toddler would say, Abba, dear Daddy. Turn with me now to Mark 14.34. Mark 14.34. The very first place that we find the word Abba used in the New Testament it's very interesting. It's full of emotion and passion and feeling. Abba, the name that we can call our Father in heaven, is first used by Jesus, our Savior, and brother and master in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, struggling with the enormity of his commission before him, the horribly slow death and torture that awaited him, and feeling the weight of all the sins of mankind coming upon him, felt pretty down for, that, for part of that night, and he fell on his face, and he talked to his heavenly daddy, his Appa. Talk about the weight that he felt. You know, the word Gethsemane means olive press, a huge stone that was used to press the oil out of olives. Our husband, Jesus Christ, felt that press. He felt that weight of all the world on him, of all the world's sins on him. I think something very, very painful happened right there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not just on the cross. The pain and the agony and the passion happened hugely right in Gethsemane as he began to feel the weight, the enormity of his mission. It was deeply depressing for a time. Probably most of us most of all he was not looking forward to was being separated from Abba for the first time ever. Once all the sins of humanity were going to be heaped on his perfect life, God the Father says our sins will separate us from God the Father. So in Mark 14, verse 34 to 36, then he said to them, this is Peter, James, and John, he says to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Today's language, we might say, hey guys, I really feel crushed inside, full of grief. I am really, really down. I, I could just die. I'm so down. I mean, that's what he's saying. I, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. In verse 35, he went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible... The hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Abba, Father, Abba, all things are possible for you, Abba. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. The passion of our husband, of our Lord, was intense at that moment. Believe you me, there was passion felt in heaven too by Abba. Jesus Father and your Father. Could you as a father, could any father with unlimited power at your disposal easily sit by and watch your perfect son suffering so much without stopping the anguish and suffering? If you could help but don't and can't because you realize this anguish has to happen, the sacrifice, the redemption, the atonement has to happen, the anguish our Abba Father was feeling had to be at least as much as what Jesus was feeling, perhaps even more. I'm sure at that instant he was thinking, boy, I'd go down there in an instant and do it for him. Would it you? That level of intimacy Jesus has at this moment in the garden is what you and I can have with Appa as well. We truly become his children. Remember, slaves were not allowed to address the head of the household as Abba. 
That was a right afforded only to real children or adopted children of the Father. That's why it says in Galatians 4, verses 6 to 7, And because you are sons or children, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Okay, crying out, Abba, Father. Now why did I spend so much time on God being our Abba? Because any father gives his children his name. My kids are shields. Your kids are whatever they are. And as, as such now, when we come together, even as God's people, as his children, God and Jesus said in John 17:21 that they want us to be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, John 17, 21, that these, my disciples, our, our, our family, may also be one in us, may be one in us, that the world may, be, may believe that you sent me. Now, disciples were obviously many different personalities and different people, but he wanted them to act as one, be one, in purpose, harmony, and unity. And so the love that was supposed to be so evident that they were like one body working together, one mind. Boy, brethren, we're not there yet. And we've just got to get there with God's Spirit working with each other. Quit the factions that we have and humble ourselves. Come together. Forgive one another. So we're going to be named the same thing as our Father. We'll have his name on us. That's why it says in Revelation 3.12, I'll write upon him the name of my God. And uh, I'm going to, that family name, in the beginning, God, in Genesis 1.1, the word there is Elohim, that's probably the family name. Elohim is God's family name. And uh, so we'll be called, our name will include the name Elohim, God. God. Because just as my children are shields, and they are humans like I am, someday we are also going to be fully of that family of God. And we are beget, begotten now of his spirit, so we can be truly sons of God. We shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. First John 3, verse 1. That's a truth that many ignore and don't want to accept. But uh, we have to accept that, that we shall be like him. Are you upholding that name? Are you upholding that name? Revelation 14, 1 says that, uh, John saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. Are you upholding that name? Have we come all the way out of Babylon? Are we moving into the kingdom of our Father more and more as we live and move and have and 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 and, and with Him as our very being? Okay, so that's the first thing. The name of my my God, Elohim, can be part of our name. What an awesome thing to have God as our Father. The second thing is the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. That's what it says in Revelation 3.12. I'll write on him the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. When this is understood, it's really inspiring. Now, for example, the title, the Prince of Wales. Let's look at how this title came to be, Prince of Wales. In 1301, the King, King Edward I was a military-type uh, leader of England, and he had conquered Wales. And then the following year, he had his son born in Carnarvon Castle, I don't know if I'm saying that right, in Wales in 1302. That baby was called the Prince of Wales because he was born there. And the custom stuck, the custom of calling the heir to the throne the Prince of Wales. I don't think the Welsh in 1302 liked it any. But my point is we know if we're introduced to someone who, who is called the Prince of Wales, we know that that person is the next King of England. That is, of course, Prince Charles's title today. When Queen Elizabeth had a baby son born 50 years ago, he was given a new name. In fact, several new names. He was given the family name of the House of Windsor. You know, Windsor Castle. Of the House of Windsor. Prince of Wales. Charles. Then all his numerous middle names. His title, Prince, of, uh, Prince Charles of the House of Windsor, the Prince of Wales, tells, tells everybody who understands it that he's the successor to the throne of England will be no different. When we have the name of our God and the name of the city of our God, it says we're from there, not from here. We were born there, as it were, not here. The way God sees it, since heavenly Jerusalem is called the mother of us all, 
of all of God's children. In Galatians 4.26 it says, The Jerusalem above, the mother of us all. The mother of us all is not the church. The mother of us all is Jerusalem above, the heavenly Mount Zion. That's the mother of us all. Galatians 4.26 says so. Uh, we are the church. How can we be our own mother? We are the church. We are the bride of Christ. And that bride of Christ, the mother of the bride of Christ, is heavenly Jerusalem. When we are citizens of a particular country, we're registered as citizens of that country. So in Hebrews 12, verse 22 to 24, you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to, the, to an innumerable company of, num, uh, of angels, can't talk, <laughs> to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. I think that's why some people would say the church is the mother of all because of this passage. But I think when you put it together with Galatians 4.26, um, I still say that the church is the bride and the mother of us all is what Galatians 4 says to heavenly Jerusalem, and the mother of us all. But anyway, you've come to Mount Zion and are registered in heaven. Now turn to Psalm 87. Psalm 87 a little behind here, so i got to speed up. Psalm 87, verses 1 to 6. This is a psalm of one of the sons of Korah. And boy, talk about uh, people being able to start over and have a new name. Uh, Korah's sons really did that. Korah was uh, not a good guy, but his uh, sons ended up writing an awful lot of the psalms. This is one of them. Psalm 87, verses 1 to 6. It was a song. His foundation is the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Selah. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Okay? Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Now verse 4, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. Yeah, God will talk about Ethiopia and other places. But of Zion... Heavenly Jerusalem. It will be said, this one, pointing out different people in God's kingdom, this one and that one were born in her, in heavenly Zion. And the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the people, this one, meaning you, brethren, your name, this one, was born there. Are you hearing what that verse is saying of you and me? That verse is saying what Revelation 3.12 lends credence to. And that's the, the Spanish practice who retain both their father's and mother's name as well as that of their new spouse. Our father's name is Elohim. Our mother's name is Jerusalem above. The heavenly Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. So what all this means so far is when you are introduced to people... You are going to be introduced as someone who was born in heavenly Jerusalem. In the world to come, when God sends you on a mission, when you're introduced to an audience, your name, including the phrase of heavenly Jerusalem, which will be included in your name, will tell everybody that you're among the firstborn automatically with that title in your name, that you're the firstfruits, and that you are a prince or princess of that kingdom, in the very same way that when someone hears the title Prince of Wales, they understand that that person also is royalty. Isn't that incredible how God can take someone like me and you? I have no redeeming value in myself and nor do you. And if you think you do, Paul said, I know that in, my, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, no good dwells. Romans 7 says that. But when God comes to dwell in us, all kinds of good dwells in us. It's a different it's a different scene altogether. And it's a new, new beginning for you and me. Let's let each other enjoy that new beginning. Don't oh man, people let's 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 enjoy it. As everyone eventually becomes converted, knowing your name, that includes where you're from, 
will help you, in fact, be far more effective and get things done faster. You're a son of God on a mission from the king, is what that name means. See, it's not just about vainglory. It's about helping you be a better servant. It's about helping you accomplish the missions that God's going to send you on. In fact, besides being a child of God, you'll also be the bride of the King of Kings. And I hope you'll hear my three-part series, Christ, the Mystery of Christ and the Church. That's three parts, but it goes in depth into that. Now, the third name... Uh, the third name is uh, mentioned in Revelation 3.12. Okay, the first one is the name of my God, Elohim. Okay, that's God's name. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. So we have Elohim as part of our new name. We have Heavenly Jerusalem as part of our new name. Then it says, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, my new name could mean sharing his own new name with us. Or it could be giving us our own new name but one that he has come up with, hence my new name, for us. It's not really clear which one it means here. But it could mean both. It could be that we share Jesus' new name, certainly being the wife of Jesus. When I married Carol, my wife, she took on my name and shares that name with me. So when a bride marries, she takes on the name of her husband. Our husband is Christ. We are Christ Christians, Christians. Father will give Jesus a new name to add to as many others, just as Prince Charles has many middle names. It says, in fact, in Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Why don't you turn over there? Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven opened. This is after the marriage of the Lamb in heaven has taken place. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. So... If that's the name that he gives us, then it kind of doesn't go along with what it says in Revelation 3.12, that he gives us this name, his new name. That means we would know what, what that name was. But in this case, he has a name that no one knows except himself. Among his many other names, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's a name that he does know that we know as well, okay? He has many names. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Horses, that's the same uh, description as the bride, uh, their attire. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. He's coming to rule this time. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. So he does have a new name, several new names. Word of God, a name no one knows. He has the name King of Kings and then Lord of Lords. So Jesus has many, many names. Psalm 9, I mean uh, Isaiah 9, talks about a wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace, Almighty, you know, Mighty Father, and so on. In fact, let's turn there. Uh, Isaiah 9, start in verse 6, actually. Isaiah, Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. It's a great passage about how the name of the Son of God reveals who and what he is, what he's going to be, what he's going to do, what his reputation will be. Isaiah 9, verse 6. I hope you're there. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called. You ready? Isaiah 9, 6. Wonderful. What a name to have. Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So here even the Son is called Everlasting Father, and yes, he is also Mighty God. And yes, when Jesus marries his bride, the church, they will have offspring, others that are converted in the millennium and beyond that. And in that regard, he becomes also their father in that way. And so... We, too, may be given some of those names. If we understand, I will give him my name to mean that. Or it can also mean I will give him the new name that I have come up with for him, for her. 
that God will have new names for for each of each of His uh, converted members of His family. I think it's both personally, and we'll be given one of Jesus' names as as a, as a wife of Jesus Christ, and we will also be renamed something very special, being given our own new name. Excuse me, just a second. I personally think we're going to be given several new names. Now, one possibility, a name which is only for us to know, it says in Revelation 2.17, is one of the names we might be given. This is written to one of the other churches. In Revelation 2.17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 2.17, To him who overcomes. Now, we have to overcome. And Jesus Christ in us helps us overcome. If we let him lead us and guide us and we walk with him, he says, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will see in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, they had the ark there. And inside this box, this golden box called the ark, over which was the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. In the ark was the Ten Commandments and also the hidden manna to eat and Aaron's rod that budded. And the top of the ark was called the mercy seat. But anyway, so it says here, I'll give him some of the hidden manatee. It's meaning that you're going to be right there on the seat there with me. And I will give him a white stone. Now that has to mean something along the lines of being justified and being made pure and innocent. Uh, back in those days, uh, someone was uh, guilty. They In, in court, they, they, the judge or the jury would have a black stone that they would hand out. If he was uh, proclaimed innocent, it would be a white stone. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So God has something very, very special for you. I don't fully understand why no one would know that name except you, except it must mean something. It must be something very, very special for you and very intimate. Is all I can imagine. Now, so we'll be given that name also. Apparently, a special name no one else knows. Just we know it. Or at least up to that point, no one knows it, unless we reveal it to others, I suppose. I don't know. Or it can also mean, beyond that, that there's a name that will be given, which I think is very real, which will reflect the way God and Jesus now see us. God names people for the way they will be, or the way they have become. For example, he called the first man, Claude, Red Dirt. Red earth, Adam, Adam, that's what red, that's what Adam means, is red earth. Don't ever forget, Adam, God saying, you did not evolve. You did not climb from slime. You didn't evolve. You didn't come from scum. No, Adam, you're a clod from God. <laughs> you're red earth. I made you from the dust of the earth. Remember that. Dust you are, Adam, and dust you shall return. Eve means life, since she's the mother of all living. Abram means father of elevation, was changed to Abraham, meaning father of a multitude. And then his wife Sarai, S-A-R-A-I, was the meaning of Sarai is contentious. And certainly she could be. And uh, when she got mad at Hagar, it says that the Bible says very clearly that she was Severe with Hagar, to the point where Hagar had to run away. Couldn't stand it any longer. These uh, Bible people of Abraham and Sarah, we always think of them as being so perfect, but they weren't, brethren. They're human beings like you and I. And God redeemed them and saved them as much as he's going to save you and I. They, they didn't get there on their own merits. And then her name was changed to Sarah, which means princess. Because we're all being called to be part of God's family and the royalty. The real royalty for all eternity. Jacob, Abraham's grandson, means supplanter because after they were, as he was being born, you know, he uh, kind of grabs the, you know, the story there. But anyway, later on, uh, he wrestles with the one who becomes Jesus Christ in Genesis 32:28. You can read about it. He wrestles all night with the one who becomes Jesus. And uh, the one who becomes Jesus says to Jacob in Genesis 32:28, Your name shall no longer be called J uh, Jacob, but Israel. For Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So Israel means overcomer. 
prevailer with God, prince of God. Different names, different uh, things I've looked up say Israel means all of those. Overcomer, prevailer with God, prince of God. Saul of Acts 8, the one who was consenting to the death of Stephen, was renamed Paul. Some thought he was pretty. Uh, he must have thought he was pretty big stuff. So God renames him Paul, meaning little. It also happens negatively. Satan uh, means adversary because he had turned into God's enemy. The devil means accuser. So Satan, the devil, means the enemy who slanders, who accuses and slanders. And the slanderer is out there slandering you and me every day too. And don't be a slanderer, brethren. If you ever hear somebody slandering somebody, understand whose spirit they're listening to. The love of God covers a multitude of sins. The love of God believes all things, hopes all things, keeps no record of wrong. It says in 1 Corinthians 13. And when you have people keeping a record of wrong, actually keeping records of wrong and passing out those records of wrong, that's of Satan the devil, and God be merciful to their soul. Satan the devil is who they're listening to. Whenever you hear someone slandering, Understand, brethren, whose spirit they are of. Don't you be that way, and you pray that God be forgiving of people like that. Now, God and your husband, Jesus Christ, consider you and me and those of us in his body right now worthy of buying back. So don't ask me how or why, except by his abundant grace, his overflowing love, his unending capacity, forgive and forget. And uh, no matter what you've done negatively, he's willing to redeem you. That's why Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know my Redeemer lives. Now, what will that new name be? Well, just as we name a baby soon after it's born, soon after we're born again in the fullest sense, as a completely new spirit being, and I believe there's overwhelming evidence that we have the wedding supper in heavenly Jerusalem above, here my three-part series on the mystery of Christ in the church, and part three of that series goes into a full explanation of that. My vision of this is this. Now, we're, 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 we've been, we meet Christ in the air. He takes us up to heaven on, on, to, on the sea of glass to be married because it says a great king puts on a wedding for his son. And Matthew is at 22, I think it is. And who is that great king? It's God the Father. And it says he comes into the wedding and sees the guests. And so where can that be except where Father is? And that sea of glass, a massive, massive place, sparkling in brilliant light, in the very temple of God up there in heaven. Okay, the, the temple currently is up there in heaven. There is a temple in heaven, a huge temple and a huge sea of glass there. A sea of glass, not a pond of glass. The 144,000 come in. The applause, the cheers, the hosannas, the angelic choruses, the thunder, the lightning, as we come and kneel before God our Father and worship Him. And then Abba rises and accepts us gladly, emotionally, and passionately, as did the father of the prodigal son when he came home. And now we're with Abba, finally. Now we're home. And the mood, the emotion, the thrill, the joy, the oneness is going to be beyond the frail attempt to describe. I think it is in heaven. I think that's where the wedding supper takes place. Who else would be worthy of performing the wedding except God the Father himself? Where else is the only place fitting enough for such a wedding? And you do remember, don't you? It says in Revelation 19 that the wedding is in heaven. Revelation 19, verse 1. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, and then after the wedding takes place, it says that now I saw heaven open in Revelation 19, 11. And behold, a white horse. And now it says that we come out and down from heaven following Christ. And certainly the ones who are following him are his saints, it says in Zechariah 14, 5, Jude 14 and 15. And so the saints of God are going to be in heaven following Jesus Christ back down. So here's the full tape on it. I just want to be there is the main thing. I don't care where, the, uh, where it is going to be held. I really don't. I know God's going to have the very best possible. Some feel it's going to be on earth after we land on the Mount of Olives. Um, one man I know uh, feels very strongly uh, that it's on a portable sea of glass hovering above earthly Jerusalem. Um, I, whoever's right, it doesn't matter to me. and I may be terribly wrong, but I feel very strongly that we go to the third heaven where God is. Some call it the seventh heaven, but wherever God is, we have to wait and see. I just want to be there, brethren. 
I know it's going to be good. Now turn to Isaiah 62, verses 1 to 5. Isaiah 62, verses 1 to 5. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as a brightness. Verse 2, the Gentiles shall see your righteousness. And you shall be called by a new name. I'm skipping just a few words for time's sake. I'm running behind. Which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall be called, or you shall be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephzibah, meaning my delight is in her, and your land will be called Beulah, meaning married. For the Lord delights in you. The Lord delights in you. And the land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God, that's the bridegroom, rejoice over you, the bride. When we come before God, it says here in, in the continuing verse, I'm going to pick up in verse 11. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, Say to the daughter of Zion, Surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Almighty, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called the sought out, a city not forsaken. Now, brethren, when you are called forward and given your new name, what will it be? What do you think God will name you? I think you and I are going to hear some incredibly endearing and encouraging words from our Savior and our Father. I believe they will tell the assembled group some of the really awesome things that you did as led by His Spirit that nobody even knew about, or some things about your new nature and your character that perhaps are precious to God. Scripture supports what I says, what I said just now. In 1 Timothy 5, verses 24 and 25, 1 Timothy 5, 24 and 25, says the, sin, the sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others are trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. And so their good deeds won't be known until later in many cases. But so God, I'm sure, will introduce each one of us one by one to the group and then announce a new name and announce maybe privately, whispering to us our private new name as well. I think there's going to be names like, you know, this person was such an encourager to people. I'm going to call her encourager. Or I'm going to call this one prevailer in prayer. And another one might be called gentleness personified. Another one might be called unspeakable joy. Another one's name might be happiness bringer or enlightener, loving one, steadfast one, perseverer, everlasting peace. I don't know what your name's going to be. And you and I are going to look at God and our Father, our Abba, and Jesus Christ. You're talking about me? That's how you see me? I always thought I never measured up. God, I failed. I failed so often, God. How can you think of me that way? And God will wipe away every tear, embrace us, welcome us into his family and he'll be able to say yes this is you and when we come before God in heaven after the first resurrection it won't be to be chastened or judged in a negative way why do so many of us insist on seeing our Abba that way 1 Corinthians 4 verses 4 and 5 Paul says I know nothing before the he says he says verse 5 therefore judge nothing before the time till the Lord comes who will bring forth to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts and then each one's praise will come from God each one's praise will come from God no wonder T John T I mean God uh, through Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6 that when you do your good deeds don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing but do things in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. When will that reward openly happen? I believe in heaven on the sea of glass, as we're presented to Father just before the wedding supper, and just before we return with our husband to the earth. Brethren, we're so hard on each other. God, God is going to give us a new name. He wants us to start looking at each other that way as a new creation. 
Please hear my tapes about forgiving one another the same way God forgives us. And please hear the one about being a new creation. We need to view each other in this new light. So when Abba looks down and sees you, if you have accepted the redemption of Jesus Christ, he does not see our puny efforts and failings. He sees Jesus Christ clothing us. He sees the righteousness of Christ over us. He sees us as being in Christ. He sees us as a temple of his spirit, as the very body of his own perfect son. That's what Philippians 3, verses 7 to 11 says. If you'd rather have your own righteousness be seen, more power to you. Knock yourself out. But your own righteousness will never measure up, ever. Maybe you'd rather listen to what Apostle Paul says, Philippians 3, verses 7 to 11. He says, What things were gained to me, those I've counted lost for Christ, yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith, in Christ, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And that's why in, Je in Jeremiah 33:16, it says that we will be called the Lord our righteousness. Jerusalem will be called the Lord our righteousness at that time. Jeremiah 33:16. So the righteousness which God will see is the righteousness which He's given us by faith, the righteousness from Christ, the righteousness of Christ. So if Abba, Father, sees us in new light, should we not be striving to be kinder to one another, forgiving one another, letting old sins be old and buried, letting failings fall, fall by the side by the grace of God? Should the children of God, who are truly children of God, not finally come together as one? We've all done some unspiritual grave digging, brethren. We've got to stop it. Let sinners move on, including yourself. Move ahead. Let him put any failed past behind him. Hear my message, please, about becoming a new creation. Now, what's the point of all this? i got to wrap up. The point of all of this is that the titles are going to be there to help us be better servants. As people will understand who we are by the names we're, we're given, that will encourage them to trust us, to like us, to have faith that we too will be whatever that name we will have represents. And when they hear the name of the city of Jerusalem, they hear the name of, of the name of our God, They'll know that we're a son of God, a child of God, a daughter of God. And that we're able to have the power of God behind us to help them solve their problems. To help them mend their hurts. To help heal them. To help heal the world and rebuild a new world. It's there so we can be a better servant. Does it matter if people know what you've done or not in the past? We all, let's face it, we love appreciation. God the Father is going to appreciate you. He's going to mention those things, and he's going to help you get the job done, and he's going to bring out publicly at that time the good you've done. And people will understand that you're now part of the Bride of Christ, based in Jerusalem, born in heavenly Mount, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, and already part of the Spirit-born family of God. Brethren, value your new names that you're being given. Value the name you already carry, the name of God. Value the mother's name you carry with you, Holy Jerusalem above. Protect your name. Cherish it. Cherish your name, the name of God, whose honor and reputation we also carry. With every deed, every word, every action of our lives, we must be overcoming. We must be walking with God. We must be diligently seeking him and carrying that name as a holy thing, as a holy name with us every day of our lives. If you've flubbed it up in the past, let it go and move on. Pick up God's name and walk with God. Let God see a new start. Let people say what they'll say. Let them do what they'll do. But let's be new and new in Christ. And let's encourage one another to be new. Let's practice the love that God says we should have for one another. Let's do what love is supposed to be doing. It, does, it keeps no record of wrong. It believes all things. It hopes for the best. And it buries a multitude of sins. That's it for today, folks. God encourage your hearts. God bless you. God keep you, preserve you, shine his light upon you, bless you, love you. And may God guide you and may you always feel the love of God in your lives. And let that love flow to all of God's children and even to those who are not yet God's children, to all mankind. It's time we do come together, be one again. Until next time, this is Philip. 
God bless you all.